Hello, my name is Dmitry Vyukov. I work as software engineer at Google in the Dynamic Tools team. And I'm going to talk, present Sysbot and the Tale of Thousand kernel box. So first of all, I would like to ask how many of you uh, know about Sysbot and Syscaller? Okay, so roughly half maybe. So how many of you love Sysbot? Okay, about 10 people. And how many of you hate, hate this bot? Okay, two, three. And how, how many of you both love and hate this bot? <laughs> okay, few people also. That, that would be a majority. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about kernel bug disaster. And then I'm going to talk about what we're trying to do with this. And then I will talk about what we're not doing yet and where we need help. <clears throat> so as we know, today's civilization runs on Linux. We have two billion Android users. We have cloud, servers, supercomputers, desktops, notebooks, also cars, plants, space station, and last but not least, our coffee machines. And security is critical. Uh, Linux protects privacy of more than two billion uh, user people and protects corp, corp and government information. It protects safety critical systems and is the first line of defense for all incoming network packets, for untrusted application, for virtual machine guests, and also USB, NFC, Bluetooth traffic. Uh, also for things like cars, phones, and plants, uh, stability and safety are also critical. So you can say that Linux kernel is one of the most security critical components in the world, world today, or maybe the, the most. Uh, so there are all those bugs with logos and bold headlines, and they kind of produce lots of noise. People start, start running and screaming, and then we kind of fix them, and then number of known bugs with logos is zero, so we're kind of good. But that's only the tip of the iceberg, because kernel has bugs, and it has lots of bugs. And as we know, bugs are the source of security issues. Uh, so last year, there were uh, 450 CVs registered on kernel, and some of them were classified as code execution, some as, as gain privileges. Uh, but lots of bugs are unaccounted here. And last year, there were more than 4,000 kind of official bug fixes. I think they count them by those fixes tags. So again, lots are unaccounted here. Uh, about a year ago, we deployed a system called Sysbot, which is a continuous kernel fuzzing system. And for the past 12 months, it reports uh, about 200 bugs per month. Uh, we, it reported more than 1,000 now in upstream kernel and uh, 1,200 bugs in Android, Chrome OS, and some of our internal kernels. And before that, we also used uh, the fuzzer manually and reported more than 1,000 bugs for, for the previous two years. So in total, we reported uh, more than 3,000 bugs now. Uh, to give you one example, <clears throat> Some time ago, we started testing USB stack from the external side, so from the side of the USB cable connected to the, to the machine. And by barely scratching the surface, we found more than 80 bugs. So all those bugs, there were all kind of bad bugs, including use after free, out of bounds, double freeze, and all those bugs are triggerable by just any cable that, that you connect to the machine. Uh, and we didn't give, even get past handshakes, so we didn't actually test the main driver code because we just ran out of time and had to switch to something else. Uh, but use, so I'm sure that there are two, three, five hundred bugs actually more that we didn't find yet. And USB is not special. This flow of bugs is representative for just any subsystem that we start testing: KVM, TCP, UDP, you know, Sound, 9P, BPF, you name it. Uh, here you can see a snippet from, from the Sysbot dashboard. So uh, now we have more than 200 open bugs. Uh, we have their, you know, things like use of the free out of bounds. Uh, they still happen. They have reproducers. They were reported a while ago, uh, still unfixed. So that, that's what currently present in the kernel. Of course, we're getting not just use of the freeze and out of bounds. We are getting some mix of bugs. Um, besides that, 
uh, things like uh, bug uh, warning, null deref, uh, initialized memory, deadlocks, hangs, and all other stuff. Uh, but the modest estimation that we reported at least 500 security bugs, and this is not counting things like local denying of service. And very few of those bugs uh, have CVEs. Uh, it's important to note that the exploit doesn't necessarily mean a use after free. Uh, we've seen a case when a machine was just unresponsive, but after debugging, it turned out to be a full guest to host escape because now, uh, there was a uh, guest triggerable page reference leak. Uh, we've seen a warning that turned out to be inter-process, inter-VM information leak because that was a warning to restore registers in the context switch. And we've seen stalls that turned out to be remote denying of service um, bugs. But that's not, that, that's not all. Uh, so I looked at the number of backports in the stable releases, so should I say stable? Um, and for the, for the latest active ones, like 4.4, 4.9, we have almost 10,000 backports there. So not all of them are uh, bug fixes, but I sampled maybe 100 of them and got the impression that more than 95% of them are actually bug fixes, so like almost all of them. And on top of this, we also have some fixes that are already upstream but not backported yet. And this happens frequently because there's just no process. Uh, we know that there's at least 700 of them, uh, but most likely, most likely much more. Uh, there are also bugs that are already found upstream but just not fixed yet. Uh, also hundreds and obviously lots of bugs that we didn't find yet for, for various reasons. Uh, so based on that, I can conclude that every looks good and stable releases that we produce actually contains more than 20,000 bugs. And no, it's not getting better over time, so it's not that we can fix this massive amount of bugs and now the, the code is much better and we don't have them. So if anything, it only becomes worse. And no, this is not normal. Uh, <clears throat> but the state of the upstream and even stable doesn't matter in, in the end, because uh, nobody uses upstream, right? People, people have own forks of the kernel and that's what they use. So the state of those, let's say distros, what, what actually matters in practice. And distro people say that they simply can't keep up with you know, this flow of changes. <clears throat> and, and there are CVEs are filed on, on very few of those bugs. <clears throat> so the stable process is not fully working and the CV process is not working. And if you ask why, this uh, another view for the stable releases, this uh, number of backports per month. And to make it more apple to apples, I split it for the first year of uh, release life and the second year of re release life. So you can see that for 4.9, it was 400 first year and then 500 per month next year. And for the latest one, 4.14, it's now at about 700 per month for the past nine months. Uh, so this is, this is a huge amount, right? It's like 22 per day, each day, no weekends. Uh, so people can't, can't, can't keep up with this. And then, uh, so people don't use upstream, right? Everybody fork the kernels. And there are lots of those forks <clears throat> out there. And each, each forked bug is effectively a new bug for most practical purposes because that's a separate code base maintained by separate people, separate process, separate testing. So bug can be fixed in one, but not in another. Uh, so say for, for Google, so if upstream contains 20,000 bugs, so for Google it already makes it uh, hundreds of thousands of bugs that we need to deal with. And if you look at this industry wide, this already makes millions of bugs that people need to deal with. Uh, <clears throat> So being on stable helps a lot, um, but it's still a huge stream of bugs, and you obviously don't want something like um, continuous deployment to space station, right? You can still need to do some testing. And um, bugs are being backported to stable too, and at a significant rate, which is kind of uh, reasonable because bugs are being introduced at high rate, then there's a weak testing, 
So bug fixes contain bugs, and those bugs are being backported to stable. And there are also stable specific bugs to like missed backports or just things slightly different. <clears throat> And uh, obviously, th there are some distributions who have a large number of custom patches, and for them, uh, any backporting is a, is a pain and uh, work, right? And there are also those things like um, board support packages, which frequently basically not updated at all after they've been released. Uh, and this kind of makes me sad. So it doesn't look like the situation that should you know, that how should th things should be for the system that is as fundamental, as, as security critical as Linux kernel. So I would say that we need to reduce number of bugs per release by a hundred. So not just an order of magnitude, but two orders of ma magnitude to get to something like 200, which is much more, you know, reasonable to deal with. Uh, so there are some defenses, which is great, but uh, existing defenses are not enough to protect from that many bugs. Uh, so there is attack surface reduction, which is great, uh, but this large uh, surface is still open and most subsystems are still relevant. So for example, uh, USB is not relevant for servers, but relevant for clients and na namespace is the other way around. So kind of in the end, we still care about all of them. And we have some mitigations uh, like stack protector and um, ref count hardening, uh, but they simply can mitigate from hundreds of arbitrary memory corruptions uh, because usually they, it's assumed that there are few bugs and then mitigations maybe can help uh, with that. Uh, they also don't mitigate lots of types of bugs um, like races and initialized memory, or if there is a more or less like uh, write what were primitive, then it's just game over. Um, and the CFI is also not completely effective in the kernel because for some functions there is very large number of uh, functions with the same signature. And for example, for read, uh, read callbacks uh, function, the, there are about 4,000 of the, them with this signature and any of them can be called. <clears throat> and some mitigations also not backported or not enabled to some kernels because obviously performance. Then there are things like SLinux Linux namespaces or FS Verity, but this is just a logical protection. So they simply, uh, they directly assume that the kernel is not buggy, which is not true. And um, in particular, users' namespaces open even larger attack surface. Um, there are lots, they open lots of things that were historically kind of root only and contain lots of bugs. So today it's even unclear if it's a win or not uh, with, with respect to security. And there's a thing that called hidden buggy code under root. Um, so it can help to some degree, but uh, things like SLinux, Linux, IMA, more module signing, they significantly restrict root, and uh, now it simply can't say a lot of arbitrary code in, into kernel. And for example, on Android, root is just explicitly not a trusted entity. So when people uh, get execution in a process with root privileges, they still go for a kernel exploit. And in the end, users still need to do what they need to do. So if they need to mount an image and it's protected by a root, like what do they do? They just say pseudo. So they start saying pseudo left and right and uh, still kind of uh, uh, exercise this functionality. Uh, so defenses, existing defenses can't help with, you know, kind of save us uh, on the security from, front from that many bugs in the kernel. Okay, and that's it for the, for the sad part, and now not so sad part, so about what we're trying to do with this. So uh, what we're doing is only part of the solution. The so situation is significantly rusty, so it's not that there's just one magic thing that we can do and magically solve this whole problem. Uh, so we have several bug detection tools that are called, uh, they're called KSN, KMSN, and KTSN. Uh, 
Uh, we also have bug discovery tool called syscaller, which is system call fuzzer. And we have system called sysbot, which is uh, automated systematic testing solution. So KSN or kernel address sanitizer, it's kind of our security workhorse, both in kernel and in user space. It detects uh, uh, bugs like use after free and out of bounds on the heap stack and globals. Uh, it detects bugs right at the point of occurrence. It provides informative reports. So for example, for use after free, it says where the stack where the bad access happens, where the heap block was allocated and where it was freed. Uh, it's easy to use, you just enable config case and uh, the tool is based on compiler instrumentation and you need, I think, GC 4.9 at least, or Clang. Um, it's also reasonably fast and ha has reasonable memory overhead of about 2x, but uh, that's only for the kernel part of the workload and the kernel usually takes small time of the overall CPU time. So in practice it may be close be close to actually unnoticeable. And it's upstream in the kernel since 4.3. The next tool is called KMSEN, a kernel memory sanitizer. Uh, it detects uses of initialized values in kernel. And in the context of security, this means in particular things like information leaks, both local and remote. And those are very easy to exploit. It's way easier than all that speculative stuff and gives you much faster channel uh, from the kernel. Um, it also can lead to control flow subversion when initialized values are used in, in control flow. And it also can lead to data attacks, for example, if we have an initialized user ID. And we've actually seen such bugs. Uh, it's not upstream yet, it's on GitHub, and at this point it's kind of almost ready, it already works. It uh, mostly enable, enabled on sysbot, uh, and finds bugs, it found more than 50 bugs upstream now. Um, but we are fighting, with, fighting currently with the long tail of various uh, false positives and uh, crashes, because the tool is quite complex. And the last tool is KTSAN, a kernel thread sanitizer, and it detects data races. Um, yes, and uh, I forgot to mention, KMSAN also requires Clang. It's, so the rest of the tool were ported to GC, and this one is, will not be ported to GC. Okay, kernel thread sanitizer. So it finds data races. Uh, so kernel data races also represent security of thread. Um, there is that common type of attack called time of check, time of use, when uh, you load something and check and then use this thing later, assuming that it's the same value, but another thread could actually change this value in between. And uh, again, sometimes we, we see data races on, uh, say, cred credentials. Um, and also lots of use after freeze and double freeze are in kernel actually caused by uh, data races. Uh, so we have prototype on GitHub. It was uh, done by an intern, and currently it's frozen due to lack of resources. It found about 20 data races. Uh, and the main obstacle for deployment is that the kernel is full of so-called benign data races, which is strictly saying undefined behavior in C, but historically kernel uh, was kind of sloppy uh, with this, and so there are lots of unmarked accesses. Yeah, so to deploy that, we would need to kind of get rid of all of them. Uh, Syscaller, so it's a system called Fuzzer. It's grammar-based and it's coverage-guided and it's mostly unsupervised. Uh, it's also multi-operating system architecture and machine type. Um, so on the first session, there was a question about the Fuchsia testing. So we also, it's ported to Fuchsia and it has Fuchsia on Sysbot. Uh, we also does GVisor and AcarOS and also all of the BSD flavors also supported mostly by Syscaller. Uh, so as compared to other fuzzers, um, it tends to find deeper bugs and it also usually provides reproducers and it does decent regression testing and it's scalable to large number of bugs. 
Uh, so I've said that it's uh, grammar-based, and what this means in practice is that uh, we have uh, declarative descriptions of system call interfaces. Uh, you can see example on the slide. Uh, so this, mo uh, this mostly like C function and structure declarations, so hopefully you can read it. Uh, they have just more semantical information for argument types and fields. And uh, those descriptions help to generate much better workload, but um, the fuzzer tests only what's being described. So it doesn't just magically test all of the kernel, it tests only uh, things for, for which it has such descriptions. And from those descriptions, we generate uh, programs in the following form. Uh, you can see an example on the slide. Um, so this is also more like C program, just the sequence of system calls with actual arguments and that's what actually we execute and mutate and, and store. Uh, and on top of this, we have the SysBot, which is a fuzzy automation system. It does continu continuous kernel and syscaller build and update, so it always uses the latest version of both. Uh, it does test machine management, it does bug deduplication, localization, and in the end it automatically reports uh, bugs to kernel mailing list and then does uh, bug status tracking, so it can understand when a bug is fixed. Okay, so that's what we're doing, but we also need your help, just because there are too many developers, too many bugs, and we simply can't handle all of this ourselves. Um, so first of all, we need more uh, of those system call descriptions uh, because cu current coverage is far from being complete and the, the more descriptions we add, the linearly more bugs we, we discover and fix. We also have poor environment setup for some things like network devices, as Linux policies and some other. So the problem is that there are hundreds of subsystems in the kernel and lots of them are quite complex, and we're not an expert in any of them. Uh, but we, we see things like, uh, say, a CVE that was classified as remote code execution, so bad, uh, and it was in something called NetFilter, and at the time we, we just didn't know that this thing exists. Or we see the Android use of the free that was classified as high severity, uh, in something called NSFS, and we still don't know what, what it is and don't test it. Um, so adding those descriptions is not hard. There is some learning curve, but when you do the second one, it should be uh, pretty easy. And we have lots of examples. Uh, the next thing is testing uh, external inputs to the kernel. Um, so currently, Syscaller can inject network packets into the networking stack via tune device, so they as if came from, from external side, and this obviously gives the most uh, critical bugs. Uh, we have some basic coverage. We, we have descriptions for Ethernet, uh, IP, TCP, and UDP, and for a few other protocols, but there, I'm sure there are more protocols, and they're quite complex, and some of them require some networking device setup. Um, so I mentioned USB, we want to revive this work and kind of actually test more of the USB drivers. Um, but then there are lots of other things like NFC, CAN, Bluetooth, uh, guest to host interfaces and maybe things like keyboard, mouse, and also the things that I don't know about yet. So some of them may require adding some stub devices like Tune that allow to kind of inject the inputs into that system as, is, as if they came from external side. Some may already have it. <clears throat> For example, USB uh, have such support and it doesn't require any additional devices. Okay, uh, so we also have lots of open box. Uh, hundreds of bugs that uh, was reported and not fixed. Some of them are just bad vulnerabilities in itself. Um, other, say, affect stability or denying of surface type, type of bugs. Uh, but even the rest, they still harm the scholar's ability to uncover more critical bugs. So 
uh, we can expect that we will find all of the critical ones if we will not start fixing all of them. Uh, so we need help fixing those bugs and also triaging, routing, dapping, closing, fixed obsolete bugs. Um, so usually this is considered as part of the develop development workflow. So if you uh, submit code or maintain a subsystem, please also contribute to, to those efforts. Okay, so the next thing is related to KSN. <clears throat> so KSN back, uh, based on compiler instrumentation, so it checks only the C memory accesses and it checks them with, with respect to KMalloc state. Uh, so it does not check uh, memory access done in assembly, uh, done in hardware, and it doesn't detect use of the freeze and out of bounds if there is some kind of custom caching or growth amortization scheme involved. Uh, so an object can, can be freed in some custom cache, but it's not freed to the K, K malloc, right, to the slabs, so it's still considered as allocated and KSN will not catch back on such objects. Um, KSN has annotation for both checking a mem uh, range of memory if it's good or bad, and also annotating a range of memory as a good or bad. Uh, so a good example is SKB. Uh, SKB is a core networking data structure and it's used to hold packet data. Um, it has uh, so-called linear data, which is a just directly accessible buffer of packet data. Um, and there is an API, like you can ask for to pull in, say, two bytes into this linear buffer and then you can access those two bytes, but should not access you know, third byte. Um, or if you ask for three bytes, now you can access three bytes, but the previous buffer can be reallocated, so you should not access the, the previous pointer. Um, but the thing is that uh, SKB uses very active, uh, proactive amortized grow, uh, obviously to not reallocate you know, each time you ask for another byte. So usually you can get away with actually accessing more or accessing the old pointers. And this is super easy to get wrong, and there are lots and lots of such code, and it's just a bug nest. Um, I'm sure there are dozens of remotely triggerable bugs, which we currently not detect mostly. Uh, so it can make sense to do uh, more strict or exact grow policy on the KSN for SKB. So this is something that currently is not done. Um, obviously, we don't want those annotations sprinkled through our, the code base. Uh, but there can be some, you know, things that that's still worthy. For example, something in DMA, A2C, SPI, virtual, maybe something uh, common in uh, USB or file systems. So if you have any good ideas, uh, know that this is a kind of a way to potentially detect lots of bugs there if we add some, some additional annotations. Um, then there are some other tools which we do not use on SysBot currently, but it would be great to use them. So the first one is KMemLeak or Memory Leak Detector. And I heard from uh, server people that Memory Leak is actually the worst box out there because they just silently drain machine resources slowly and then yeah, you kind of have everything slow for and can understand why. Uh, obviously, remote memory leaks are also bad. Uh, but the problem is that the tool has false positives, and this means that we cannot use it in automatic, systematic testing setting because we re automatically report all things that we find, and uh, nobody will be happy if this will produce, you know, in constant stream of uh, false positives. Uh, so it's possible to make it precise, so, and would be very nice to do. Uh, the next tool is KUBSN on defined behavior sanitizer, and it finds some uh, kind of more local cases of undefined behavior in C. It can find uh, intra object overflows. It can find uh, cases where bool or enums have wrong values, and surprisingly, this can lead to control flow hijacking because you can have a bool that is neither true nor false, or both true and false. Or you can have, for example, a switch on, a, on an enum value implemented as a jump table, and then the compiler can eliminate the, the bounce check on the enum. Uh, also, it detects overflows and valid shifts, which 
also can lead to out of bounds access and sometimes in surprising ways. For example, if you shift, if, if variable is used as a write operand in a shift operation, then compiler can start making assumptions about the range of, of the values in that variable and a result that can say eliminate some bounds checking. Um, Okay, but the, the thing is that the kernel still needs some cleanup for those bugs, and the uh, most serious problem is that, that lots of bugs face some significant opposition, uh, especially the, the overflows, the shifts. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's kind of makes it impossible to deploy if we need to kind of have a, some, some kind of battle for each other bug. And the next tool is KTSN, which I already mentioned. Uh, so I'm sure it will find thousands of hard to localize races in kernel and provide ex actionable reports for them. Uh, but we need to say no to, to the benign races and, and just mark all concurrent access. So uh, races are undefined behavior in C and they can also, they're super subtle to reason about. Uh, and super hard to get right. So if you think that it's easy, then maybe you, you just don't see the whole problem. So even the things like aligned uh, int store a lot uh, can actually lead to very surprising things. And the last thing I wanted to touch is kernel testing. So most of the bugs can be prevented with testing and it kind of feels that we're not doing enough, that we can do much better on the kernel testing side. So we had this 20,000 bucks per release, new bugs are being introduced at a very high rate, uh, bugs are being backported to stable, uh, bugs are being reintroduced and nobody can keep up with this flow. <clears throat> and development is also slowed down because there, there's high reliance on manual labor, there are delayed releases, there are broken builds, which in particular prevent uh, bisection. So people ask us for bisection, but sometimes the kernel is broken or doesn't boot for months. Uh, there's also long fixed latency. So in most projects with modern development processes, it's usually possible to say push a critical fix, for example, for a build breakage within a day or even within an hour. And in kernel, it frequently takes months um, there also late feedback for bugs to developers. So developer can receive a bug report, you know, after you know, two or three months after it's, he submitted the the change, uh, right? And he, they already forgot about the change or already on a vacation. So I, I spent some time kind of thinking what to say here because there are kind of some tests somewhere and somebody kind of runs them sometimes and does something with the results. So if, if I say that there are no tests then, or there is, there is no testing, then it's false, right? But it still feels that kind of uh, there's something to improve uh, for testing. Uh, and I think that, that something is that testing needs to be an integral part of the development process. So it, it, not be, it should not be just something, you know, on the side done by some other people. Uh, so we need tests and tree. The tests need to be easy to write, easy to discover, easy to run, and easy to understand when they pass or fail. Uh, we need both user space tests and some internal tests with support for easy hardware mocking. Uh, we need to add tests for new functionalities, add the regression tests, and we absolutely need automated continuous testing, which is a part of the development processes and not just somewhere on the site. Uh, so we, we need pre-submit tests and we need, say, developer waiting for, the, for plus one for, from the testing infrastructure before the commit is submitted, or even, um, say, a thing called commit queue, which is now used in some projects is when the change is approved, approved by humans, it gets into the uh, commit queue, and then robots test it on head, and only if tests pass, they can automatically commit the change. And uh, the, the infrastructure also needs to use all of the available tools, because frequently we see bugs that could be trivially detected if uh, existing debugging tools would be used. 
um, yeah, but like tools like KSN and LogDep in particular, but lots of them still being committed to kernel. Uh, I understand that it's not an easy to do, easy thing to do, and it's not that they have all of the answers and kind of uh, can say what what exactly, kind of how exactly to do this, but uh, I feel that, that that's the direction where we need to move. And with this, thank you, and I'm ready to answer questions. You mentioned that you file bugs. How do you do the figuring out where to file a bug? Because there's really no clear way of figuring out how to do it. Do you look through the maintainer's file? How do you figure out where the, the bug should be go to be reported? So we, we send bugs to mailing list. And we from the crash report, we try to find the guilty file, which is kind of usually on the top of the stack trace, but we skip some of the top frames, like the command, for example. If it's a mem slab, then we skip it. And then we run uh, get maintainers on that file, and that's, that's the list of the people. Do you need this process improved? Do you need a better way to figure out where the bug should be filed? Because I believe, I'll just look through the maintainers file. There's only like 19 bug, uh, where to file the bugs references. Uh, but all of them have the kind of CC, people to CC emails addresses. Right, but you mentioned that you also track when the bug's been fixed. Yes, yeah, so the kernel doesn't have the bug tracking system per se, right? Sort of. uh, there is Bugzilla, but it's not that it's kind of used. Uh, so we, we build the bug tracking process around the existing email kernel process. So the main scenario is that we, we give the reported by tag in the email, in the report email, and then the developer needs to put the stack into fix and commit. And then we pull the uh, git trees, and when we see this commit, we understand that this commit fixes that bug. And when we see this commit on all of our builders, then we close the bug. And then we, so closing bugs is important because uh, only once we close it, we can report new bugs that look similarly. And there are cases actually when we kind of see the bug that looks almost exactly the same, uh, but the new one is reported only when we close the previous one. So while well, the previous one is closed, they will all just pile into the same you know, bin. Um, I just wanted to know if there's a copy of your talk online. I saw there's a lot of hyperlinks, um, but I didn't say where they were to. So I'd just like to. Yeah. Uh, yes, I will send this tomorrow, uh, today, to organizers, and I will also post it somewhere online. I was curious what our options are if we want to fuzz. Uh, a piece of kernel code that's not reachable due to kernel config decisions. Uh, like I, I was taking a look at the, the kernel configs that you guys have, and uh, for instance, it wouldn't be possible to fuzz AppArmor currently. It, is that possible? Is there a way to specify a custom kernel config? Uh, you, you mentioned AppArmor, right? Yeah. Oh. It's enabled, but SE Linux is used okay. by default. Okay, I see. So, uh, so there are two things. One is that just the syscaller fuzzer, which anybody can run locally. Mm -hmm. uh, it can use, say, QM or virtual machines. And then you can give it any kernel and, yeah, do. So regarding sysbot, we have some fixed set of configurations. And potentially, we can add new ones. So, yeah, you could, talk you could to us. Multiple kernel configs. Yeah, so AppArmor already came up because it's also used in some of our internal kernels. It's kind of important to us too. So yeah, if you will find me and send me an email, then we can discuss this. Great, thank you. So as a developer, when something shows up in my mailbox or on the LKML that, that is clearly in my code, what's the best thing I can do to communicate back to you that we've actually done something with it or that we're not going to do something with it or any kind of 
uh, interaction that we might have because there there are several bots out there right now mm-hmm. that are doing wonderful and glorious things for us. Uh, but sometimes the question comes up is, gosh, I fixed the code, now what do I do? So with each email, there is a kind of link for more information and there you can find the mailing list for, for syscaller where you can reach us. And we usually look kind of subscribe to the reports themselves uh, but there are lots of them and we can miss something so if it's like separate proposal for our systems that it's better to send it to the, our list it's just syscaller at googlegroups.com you, you can find this email How large is the testing infrastructure in Sysbot? Uh, sorry, can you repeat? How large is the testing infrastructure in Sysbot? How many syscallers are running? How many pixel devices? Because you mentioned that you run also on devices, right? Devices. No, so Sysbot doesn't run at devices. Ah, doesn't no. run. So the syscaller fuzzer itself supports several types of machine, in particular Android phones and Android boards, and it kind of can be extended if, if, like, if you want to. Uh, so we currently run on GCE in, in the cloud, on virtual machines only for the, Sys- for the Sysbot infrastructure. And for the Linux, for the upstream Linux kernel, we have maybe 50 ma- two core machines or something like this. Any more questions? This is a bit more of a niche question, but I saw you were talking about CAN messages. Could you elaborate a little more on what that's looking for? Uh, Can you repeat, please? With the syspot, you say that one of the things to add later would be CAN functionality? Uh, CAN? Yeah, fuzzing for CAN messages, is, I believe I saw that. Uh, CAN. So currently we do something for CAN. Again, I, I don't know exactly what because I have no idea what is CAN and what are the interfaces. So I talked to CAN main maintainers and they, they had some initial interest and in actually look what we're doing and where this can be improved. And there's something for, uh, I think, actually injecting the can packets, uh, I think there was some issue, maybe it didn't work with namespaces or something, uh, but they never get back to us. So we, yeah, we have something, but I don't know what. So you can look and can we also give the, for the kernel we give coverage report uh, and you can see what parts of the, say your subsystem we cover and what parts we don't cover and you know assess how, how good is it. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you.